On this episode of DLN Extend, we talk about the future of communication and how it is a constant moving target as to what people need to switch to Linux or any platform for that matter. This episode of DLN Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean and Bitwarden. Welcome to episode 23 of DLN Extend. DLN Extend is a community-powered podcast. We take conversations from the DLN community, from places like the discourse forums, Telegram group, Discord server, and more. We also take topics from other shows around the network. So, Nate, what have you been up to this week? I always keep myself busy. Uh, OpenSUSE released the latest Leap uh, 15.2. I did a virtual installation party, you know, a properly socially distanced YouTube live stream of me installing Leap 15.2 on, on a laptop. Not a particularly powerful Ooh. laptop. And it was, it was kind of a, a couple things I want to do. One, I haven't actually done a live stream before, at least not like my own, originating from myself. So I want to kind of keep it a little bit small and less publicized, you know, so that I didn't screw up in front of a, a large audience. So I'll keep You're it kind of small. The so the yeah, Right. Yeah, dip, dipping my toes in the water before I jump in the deep end, right? I'm, I'm not a Michael. I'm not a Ryan or, you know, any of the, any of the others that is, or so I'm still working on that deal. So I did it. Uh, I actually got a lot of really positive feedback from it, a lot more than I anticipated for it. But basically it was just, I installed it and then uh, fielded questions, you know, people had it for OpenSUSE and, and so forth. Got a little notice from the OpenSUSE community as well on it as well, which is, which, uh, which I thought was great. But um, but yeah, that was part of my week. The, I would say the highlight. So what about you, Matt? What have you been up to? I have been actually readjusting some of my workflow stuff as far as uh, how I record edit for the show. So that's been an experience in trying to figure out what workflow works best for audio editing as opposed to other types of editing and whatnot. So that's been really fun. So I've been customizing Plasma a little bit different because I'm a, I'm a Plasma guy. That's kind of been most of my week on top of just regular life in general. So I've been setting up Salient OS on the workstation that I have. And that's been oh, nice. my experience. Well, my... My question, because I, I, uh, I'm curious now, because you, you just piqued my curiosity. So when you say your your workflow, like how you're editing audio, like how you're importing, putting, pulling everything together and moving and shifting and cutting and whatever else? For me, workflow is a little bit different. More of a, like almost a Unity type user where that application is what I need to focus on, but how I jump between applications and the flow okay. of switching between those applications. That's how I view workflow. Yeah, I, I have noticed that you know, with me doing like new tasks, it disrupts my workflow and I have to like rethink how I do that task now and then how I do it whether I'm docked or if I'm mobile so that yeah I totally get it mobile is like from your phone or laptop from my laptop if I take my laptop off the dock and go someplace because that gotcha. changes and screws up everything so messes up where all your windows are and right and so which I mean thankfully plasma is really flexible that it just kind of it can roll with it but it does change the efficiency so when I'm single screen I'm more multi-workspace when I'm multi-screen I'm more single workspace and Wendy what have you been up to as far as tech wise not too much. We've been enjoying some family time in the mountains away from all connectivity whatsoever. So I've got to take some some really fun outdoor pictures, mess with some different filters and stuff that I have. We um, actually spent most of the 4th of July working. So my husband's family has had this little one-room cabin for years that's kind of been passed down. And a tree fell over next to it about a month ago up on the mountain. And my husband and I manually no four wheelers no side by side using just a, a rope and short little logs for rollers and moved two of these great big chunks of log down and put them into position around the the patio area so i got lots of work done lots of family time oh, family time is good sometimes we all just need to disconnect though that's, that's really the biggest thing and just kind of build our our interpersonal relationships and sometimes it's really nice to just be going get away Yes. Well, and I do. I love my technology, obviously. I'm on two different podcasts. One of them, Hardware Addicts, right? I love my technology, but there's nothing like completely disconnecting and just having those one-on-one -on -one relationships. I, I was thinking with you, with you and these logs, you know, people pay big money for CrossFit classes for moving logs <laughs> and you do it just because you have to. And that's pretty just awesome. Because, just yeah, well, gotta say. We, the, the first one, the first log moving 
came down, it was pretty rough. We had quite a few issues with it. And then the second one, which was shorter, wet wood is way heavier than dry. Yep. So the first one, I think, was 23 feet that we moved down. And then the second one was 16. And the second one, it was going so smooth. And my husband and I were talking about, yeah, this one's growing great. And then it didn't. So <laughs> one of those things, doesn't matter what project you're working on, if it's going smooth, if you say, yeah, this is going awesome. It has a tendency not to go very awesome. Anymore. You will jinx yourself. <laughs> so it's weird how that works, isn't it? This episode of Deal and Extend is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest, safest way for individuals, teams, businesses, and organizations to store their passwords. Not only does it have great features, Bitwarden is open source has had third-party security auditing. Get started for free by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN. I've been using Bitwarden for a while now and love it. Not only does it help me keep track of my hundreds of passwords, yes, there's hundreds because you should have a unique password for every website you go to, it also includes a random password generator. That way you can have a randomly generated password for each and every website that you use. Not only does it have great features, Bitwarden is open source, has had third-party security auditing, and you can get started for free by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN. Want some of their premium features like one gigabyte of file storage or vault health reports? Maybe you just want to support the project. That starts at only $10 a year, not $10 a month, not $10 a week, $10 a year. Jump over to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started with your free account right now. Speaking of rolling, let's keep on rolling right into the next stack of things. And that is on episode 188 of Ask Noah. Noah talks about privacy and then the moving target nature of it. I found this an interesting topic because privacy really is a moving target because of the, of the internet and technology and everything else. You know, Google is the biggest ad company in the planet. Trying to be privacy focused here on the internet is almost requires just as much work as it does to actually work work on the internet. <laughs> so what do you guys feel like privacy on the internet is, is something that you have to actively work for? Or is it even plausible to have that privacy? Or is that goalpost constantly moving so much because of all the technology that we're relying on? I think that it's a mix of all those concepts, which that is a completely useless statement that I just made. But let me explain it. And I'm on my internal network. And I'm doing internal things that should be private because I'm doing this. Is It's my house, my domain. It's why I have my own server and media stuff and you know and so forth now if i go outside of my network i have to put myself on guard it's the same as when i go out into my little town my town's super safe there are always hazards when you leave your house i mean there are hazards within your house but you know there's always hazards when you leave your house there are people watching you you know there could be ring doorbells and people's i always make it a point to conduct myself properly when i'm outside of my house now the way i look at it on the internet is if i'm going to go out there whatever it is i'm going to do when i'm interacting with like a employer's server or whatever, I'm making sure that everything that I conduct all my activity properly. And if I'm if I'm concerned about where I am, like let's say I'm at a hotel, then I'm going to use a VPN because I need to put an extra layer of protection against me. I, I realize that nothing is 100% secure and I realize that my goal is just to harden myself as much as possible to make me a more difficult target. So someone has to really want to go after me is really the point of it. I don't want my personal information obviously leaking out just as much as I don't want to drop my wallet on walking down the street. I don't want to drop my information on the internet when I'm you know walking about the scary streets of the world. World Wide Web. So for to me, I see it, yes, as a moving target, but you can only harden yourself as much as you know to harden yourself. And so the, the feasible as well, it's got to be sustainable. If your method of protecting yourself is not sustainable, then it's not going to work long term. So so I, so yes, I'm personally constantly shifting what I do to secure myself. Yeah, I, I agree with, with both of you in a lot of ways. And the fact that it is a moving target because you have, there's constantly different things that are coming out trying to gather your data. So whether it's a social media platform that is gathering everything you do and saving it and then selling it off or using it for ad platforms or other more malicious ways in which they're trying to get your personal data to use it in an illegal fashion or there's a boundary between or this this gray line between how do I enjoy all of the stuff that's out there and at the same time how do I protect myself so VPN is definitely another thing that we do I like services where my router 
can directly connect to the VPN. So anything else then connected to my home network is already using that VPN service. So that that's been something that's pretty important to me. Like I don't use Facebook, but it's something my husband still likes to use. And so while I don't necessarily agree or enjoy using it myself, having something like the container tabs in Firefox allows you to still use some of those not so privacy friendly platforms, but still allow protection of yourself. And it's something we have to constantly be conscious of. And I think there's a lot of people in the general overall public, this community thinks about privacy and protecting themselves a lot. That's just the group that we're in. But I know in doing stuff For my in-laws, if I'm setting up their computer, then I'm putting on certain ad blockers and that kind of thing to protect them because I know they're not thinking about it. So I'm trying to help protect other people in my life that aren't thinking of those privacy and security issues. That's the thing. Like a lot of obviously us being more into the technology end of things, we're going to use things like no script or, you know, ad blockers. And like, as an example for me, when I'm out in public, sometimes, especially if I'm on a laptop or something, if I can change my DNS to a 1.1.1.1 or 1.001 and use Cloudflare's DNS as opposed to whatever DNS I'm getting directed to normally, yeah. I'll, I'll go and do that. I'll then I use Opera generically because it creates basically an in, in browser proxy. So to give me a little more security and you know that's ironic given that it's Opera, but the fact of the matter is I do like end user f- features that are easy without having to yes. be a pain. It does require a level of work. I don't think a lot of people, like generic people, are going to want to constantly chase that moving target. We do because we understand that there's good and bad to go with like what you mentioned, one of the social networks like Facebook and Twitter and all that, sucking up all your data and all that stuff with it. But we care about that. The people who generically use most of those don't. Not saying well, they all one do. Of the, one of the good things about Noah's discussion with Dr. Andy Yen is talking about how Proton, and I've been using mail fronts for a while. They're a lot of the same way in, in that privacy focus, how they're trying to make these things more user-friendly so that we can help our non-technically minded mm. family members, friends move to some of these more privacy-focused things and have it still be integrated. And I'm super excited to see what Proton is coming up with along these suite of applications that are still protecting your privacy and and having all of that usability at the same time. Yeah, because like the, the thing I liked about that conversation was, you know, they talked about things like Proton Calendar and uh, you know, yeah. once once you tack on Proton VPN, Proton Mail, there's a nice suite of applications there that like, okay, these guys are really taking the the initiative to make this easier. I mean, you have things like Proton Bridge, which make using IMAP and like Thunderbird kind of uh, email clients plausible with Proton Mail, given how Proton Mail doesn't generically feed into that by default. So they're doing a lot of work to make it a lot easier. And I totally appreciate that work. So I think more companies like Proton Mail and are essential to help chase that constant moving target because they're always looking to be ahead of the target. On that moving target kind of standpoint, they talked about how um, they've been blocked by Russia again. They've been blocked by China. I was looking at Melfan and I saw some of their recent updates and blog posts saying, you know, they're currently being blocked by China. That's definitely part of that moving target thing is different governments saying, oh, nope, you're not allowed to use that. About circumvent may not be the best word, but still allow citizens to have their privacy and security even when... Yes. Uh, so you have bigger organizations and you have a lot of bigger uh, companies, etc., trying to actively make it harder to stay private, private oriented. And it's a pain and I get why some people just don't care. They're like, oh, if I don't have anything to to worry about, I'm not doing anything illegal. I get it. But on the same note, eventually something's always going to be illegal depending where you go. Nate, do you think some people don't care just because it it's more overwhelming. It's not that they don't care. They're just so overwhelmed by the information and stuff. I I think it's more that they don't see the value in their privacy. You know, there's a... um, we do have a a right to privacy. And I think that, you know, until someone realizes what, you know, they don't realize what they have until it's gone. 
and, and mm. people aren't paying attention is, is a lot of the problem. And so that when, you know, if, if, it get, if it gets to the point in our society where that right has been taken away and people start to see the the, the, uh, the fruits of that lack of paying attention, that's when we're going to have a problem. So I think those of us that are concerned about our privacy, we do need to be, you know, public about that and say, call organizations out when they are violating the, uh, your privacy. You know, which is actually why I use Linux. That's why I will not use Windows because I yeah. do not agree with their terms. And, you know, I, and that is an impasse. And I don't, I'm not sure what the what the fix is when you have applications that do require Windows or just not use them. But um, yeah, so there, there, there are issues that I think we need to make more public and we need to explain why it matters better. And speaking of which, Michael Tanell from Tux Digital actually had a video that he put out this week about Windows users can't seem to blame Windows for its own problem, which ties in perfectly well with this topic because that Microsoft Edge push out for the Chromium based update has been abysmal. <laughs> <laughs> they've basically force fed it and regardless. So it's going back to the old Windows 10, like here's your update regardless of what you have for settings. Uh, and people are just like, oh, they're just, it's an update. That's you not having control over your system. That's not having control over your privacy regardless. They're superseding your privacy settings and all that stuff. So to Nate's point, you're not. Uh, he's very accurate in that there are reasons not to trust these companies. I think the big thing too is you know, Windows never gets any blame for anything. Which you know, fine, whatever. The um, problems in Linux that I've had over my time, over my life of using Linux, which has been the number of problems I've actually had have been, have been so limited compared to what people have in Windows. But yet, when someone has one little issue, and you know, actually, I'm guilty of this too. When I have one update that doesn't go right, you know, I throw my hands up and I, I get all upset. But then I, I have to remember and realize, okay, how many problems have you actually had in the last 18 years? Oh, okay, all right. Why don't you calm down there, Buster? You know, uh, <laughs> well, and I think some of that comes down to like if you're using Windows all the time and you're used to those constant paper cuts it just kind of seems to be part of how it works for you and maybe as linux users we get used to like some of those tiny paper cuts too or yeah. you know, figure out workarounds that way yeah the the problem is we end up just like the linux users are gonna hate me for saying this we end up like the <laughs> windows users we end up accepting the flaws and it's just like oh that's how it worked <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that comparison i know is going to bother some people but it's really true you know you, you don't see windows power users complaining about having to registry hack the the system it's no different than having to you know g edit a, a config file in linux we view it as whatever windows power users view registry hacking same way it's no different it's just the end user because of windows foothold end users are just more used to accepting the problems because windows is just like a known commodity kind of operating system i'm gonna go ahead and have to do a, a slight sort of disagreement with you on that All right, so like using windows it's like saying oh the wheels fell off not a big deal, really. And when I when I, when my problem is like I got a little rattle in the dashboard because I didn't put something together right. You know, it's yeah. a little rattle. It doesn't that's not a problem. It's a little bit irritating when I hit a bump. You know, but it's not it's not really a problem. You just turn up the radio. You know, and it'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> it's, that, well, that's kind of that's the that's the differences in problem. It, to that point, there Windows users only have one, maybe two versions that are currently supported, and you have that, and you can't. There's so much that cannot be changed on Windows, right? It's really mm -hmm. locked in. Whereas we have all these different distributions. Do you want something that's really long-term supported? Do you want something that's rolling really fast? You get to not only choose these different things, but then you get to choose which desktop environment you're putting on top of that. So how much flexibility do you have in the desktop environment you're using? What kind of workflow do you want? There's so many different things that we get to pick and choose and change that then to sit down at a Windows machine, you're like, oh man, but my workflow is different than this. And that really does kind of play into the, the moving target though. It's like, because we're Linux users, we see the target different than say a Windows user does. So when they when a Windows user goes to a Linux box or Mac, even a Mac, their target is going to be a whole lot different. I mean, just look at Ryan's take on Mac OS. You, know, you got a hardcore Linux user going and trying Mac OS and, you know, for pros and cons of both and that series that he's been doing. I think the moving target problem is really an end user problem all around. Target is always going to move based on the user, not user base, I guess. You're, you're absolutely right. Because, I mean, look, look at you, the, the transition that, that you've gone into now doing more audio editing, you've become a moving target as to your workflow. Yes. Now, would 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 things be so flexible if you were on Windows doing that same thing? Could, could would you be able to? Add, would you be able to 
to be as efficient with the limitations that you are given on a Windows-based environment? I mean, you could get it done, but would you be as efficient? I think that's the question not a lot of people ask. So, so for me, I'm more efficient on Linux because of the way I can set it up to better flow with how I think and how I move in an operating system. Windows is very much like Mac. You can change a few things, but this is what you get. For, so for me, I'm not going to blame Windows. I'm just going to blame me because it doesn't meet my needs as far as what I need. But on the same note, you know, Windows users as a whole, though, tend to just kind of just accept the problems, though, be it power users or regular users. That That's where I'm seeing it. And it's kind of like you get certain segments of the Linux crowd who are in the same boat sometimes that like they they don't see it as a problem whereas an end like a normal end user might see it as a problem we don't they might so it, again it's dependent on the user yeah, well when we're talking about maybe sometimes the downside of Linux there was a recent post on the discourse of what applications are missing in Linux and this kind of feeds into yeah we've got our issues with Windows and all these paper cuts or big things like the wheels falling off, all of your data being deleted. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that are missing <laughs> in people's workflows or applications that are missing on Linux in that way. Yes. And that, Nate, you you had talked about this last episode where, you know, Fusion 360 being available, you know, to you as yes. a, 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 available now. Without Proton, you wouldn't be able to do that. So that would require a Windows box basically for you, wouldn't it? Right. And using it in Linux is a far more enjoyable experience for me because I can work it the way I would like to work it. It makes using Fusion 360 so a much better experience and I and I still hope it's not officially supported obviously yeah and and so that I would say is an area where I would like to see that application like quasi supported or semi supported by the company to allow its usage and, yeah. it's little things like you know uh, some features are, are just kind of broken in it right now or not mm -hmm. not totally working and uh, not, not huge well okay they're, they're semi huge features but not, not <laughs> terribly huge features not doesn't stop me from getting things done it just makes it more difficult I noticed in reading a lot of that form that one of the advantages that Windows had with its large adoption and over the years is there's a lot more of these applications that fit these niches, these tiny little niches in which people need them. And that's one thing that Linux doesn't have as much of where we're not as widely adopted in that way. The biggest thing that I've seen, like as an example, somebody mentioned Ga GOG Galaxy as an example, not being available on Linux. It kind of works through Lutris, but not really. Basically what GOG Galaxy is, it's take Lutris, what Lutris does and puts all the launchers on Windows into one system instead so that all your Steam games, like GOG games, like you play Steam, uh, Origin, all those games are just into like one launcher as opposed to like seven make a recommendation because uh natalix i'm gonna probably butcher that who would like to see joji galaxy release for like i'm gonna make a program recommendation for mini galaxy it looks like an older version of joji galaxy but it's open source it's available on linux link will be in the show notes it's a github one of the other things that a lot of people seem to be miss uh say was missing was good ux in, yeah. in that conversation so what's your take wendy on what you would consider good UX. And we're not talking just UI, we're talking user experience. One of the things that I look for in an application is how easy is it to get the things done that I need to do? How many steps does it take to do what I need to do inside of an application? And I would say that's also somewhat a moving goalpost because as you get used to and learn an application, then it's easier to do. And in the process of switching maybe from an application that's window only to one that you can use on a Linux system, there's some frustration there because you're not exactly sure how to go about maybe doing some of those old things. Darktable was that way for me when I first started using it. I was frustrated because I didn't know what things did and how to do things. And now I can just jump in there and, and it's not that big of a deal. So firing up a new application, it can I see what I need to do inside of this without wanting to rip my hair out? <laughs> What about you, Nate? Actually, I find that a, a bit, the comment a bit befuddling because, I mean, I, I use Plasma and any cute applications, 
I can do all those things. I can move buttons around wherever I want. I can shift things. And I use the, the KDE Personal Information Manager, and I've customized that UI. So I guess I'm a little bit. Uh, maybe they maybe they don't use. Maybe they use GTK based applications, and that's that's the problem for them. Some of it, like Gimp, is GTK based, which is why I prefer Qt applications because they are customizable. I can move you know uh, the UI elements around. So I, I I don't know. I think that maybe that they are need to. My response to that would be I think you need to widen your applications and, and look at some others. You know if, if that's really the the goal is to have more flexible you know, user experiences or better user, user experiences. I would say j- dump GTK and move everything to Qt. That'd be, that'd be my response to that. My response is actually going to be something totally different. Nate, what you're talking about is UI. So for me, UX is a totally different animal. U- user experience. It's, uh, I understand no, no, the idea. But what, what you were specifically talking about, user Moving interface, the these guys seem to be talking about is how you flow into other programs, how other, other programs f- take the, as much as I dislike the Adobe suite of applications, that interconnect that they all have with one another, where you can drag something from Audition into Premiere and it just, it flows. That That is a good- a project from one program to another and have it, it, this consistent- Exactly. That, that is what I think- think a lot of people don't quite grasp when we talk UI UX experience. That's why while I'm not person I like I personally can't use elementary OS just because I like my eyeballs. Um I, <laughs> dark, I, I'm a dark mode guy. So <laughs> <laughs> That's just a thing. I love the work they do. I love the fact that they have a, I believe it's called Granite, which is for applications specifically made for elementary. So they are looking for a consistent user experience from all their applications. There's another application, I believe it's called Akira, is looking to do something similar. And it, it's very cool to see that because that there's that means that open source is finally, finally putting some effort, or like real, real effort into making sure stuff has a consistent consistent look, a consistent flow, a consistent interconnect through applications and UX and UI experience. And that to me, I think is if you go and use something, say in live, then go and try to use something like Cinelira. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a Cinelira user, but the user interface and user experience is so vastly different. To me, that user experience is far more important. And the thing that I like that was recently discussed on front page Linux was the interview with Cassidy James from elementary, because you want to talk about a project that always talks about UI and UX and that user yeah. experience cannot get any more focused than these guys. But at the same time, they don't allow for the user to change the flow for their needs. They're focused Focused on a specific user experience, not but, necessarily a customizable user experience. This is the this is the chicken the egg problem that Linux has always had. Well, we don't have enough users, so we don't have the programs. Well, we don't have the programs because we don't have enough users. So, which one is it though? D- do you want to have a consistent u- user experience, a la say Mac for on Linux, or do you want to have the more free form? that we currently have, but that's going to limit your your potential user base. Well, I think we can have growth. some flow between the different applications, but that takes these different developers working together or us saying, hey, we would like these two to interact with each other. And I know in going to the discourse forum that kind of brings both of these topics in, Cassidy and all of the, the work that they do to have this consistent user interaction in their OS, and then and this thought of, hey, I would like GIMP and Darktable to work together better. And Gambus points this out as if you could create an app by yourself, be it open source or not, the license doesn't really matter here. You're probably trying to scratch your own itch in the first place. This means you're developing this app for yourself first and maybe sharing it with the community in hopes that'll be useful to other people. He goes on to talk about how before in getting these different comments of, hey, I would, you know, it would be nice if this worked different or it would be easier for people to use if you did X. In the beginning, it's one of those, hey, you're doing it wrong because it's not this way. When the overall arching point for maybe this person and with the comment is not that you're doing it wrong. I love this application. It makes my life so much better. If we tweaked it like this, then there would be even better usability overall. Well, as an example, when... GIMP went from the three pane window system to the single window. Just yeah. some, something like that is a huge usability change. It was nice too because they, they left the option. So if you want to have... Mm-hmm. 
the three pane or a single window that was easy to go back and forth. But yeah, I, I totally agree that when they went to that single window, it made it so much easier, especially for like a, a single desktop or single single monitor environment, it made it a lot easier. Mm-hmm. So that was, I thought that was fantastic. Stuff like that, that makes a better user experience. And I think that's an area that is always a moving target because the user experience always changes sometimes, you know, right now on if you're an Android user, you got material design, which is a flat looking interface that's yeah. been around since like <laughs> 2013. That's just the thing. Before that, it was more of a 3D hollow effect. User experience, I think, is something that is constantly shifting, but I think it's something that we can we can try a little more on to give a better get past where the expectation might have been to where the expectation is going to be. Oh, you know, I actually started talking and I was, um, as far as user experience goes, I, I really don't care personally what they do as long as they don't disrupt my ability to to being able to customize my personal user experience, you know, in Plasma. So as long as Plasma doesn't change their flexibility, I really don't care how much they work toward this utopia-like user experience because I, I think that's a moving <laughs> target. This episode of DLN Extend is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. DigitalOcean recently announced new features and services such as Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC, all regions free of charge. This lets you create multiple private networks to isolate your workload. Container Registry is now available to all users. Easily store and manage private container images and push images seamlessly to DigitalOcean's Kubernetes. You can get all of this plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. Get started on DigitalOcean for free with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. And you can use that $100 credit for spinning up over a dozen droplets or even some monster-sized droplets for two months. Again, get started on DigitalOcean with that $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. So I was talking earlier about the live stream that I had for, for my uh, OpenSUSE Elite Team 2 installation party. Well, the next day I did a updating the documents. I, I had no real intention of actually making a live stream out of it. And it really, I really didn't, you know, wasn't expecting an advertiser or anything along those lines. But I did want to demonstrate how easy it is to get involved into a project. So not to say that I want everyone to get jump on OpenSUSE and, and start editing wiki documents. But what I'm saying oh, is, you know, you are. There, there are things you can <laughs> I mean, if you use it, uh, it's not hard to get involved in documentation. You know, you, you know when something works doesn't work you know when things change it's pretty easy to test and then you know keep track of those things so i did a live stream also on updating wiki documentation of which i screwed up the start of it because i i thought i hit the go live and then i hit the screen and i started working but i didn't hit it apparently because it didn't go live for like you know until someone said hey are you live so whoop lesson learned let's try not to mess that one up again so i spent some time a couple hours about an hour and a half or so the actual time of updating the wiki documentation and then it helped check to make sure things are still working or if, see how things have changed between leap 15.1 and the leap 15.2 I actually get some pretty positive feedback on that one too, surprisingly. You know, anything you can do to like just get involved is important to me, you know, because I'm using Linux, which is a huge life enabler for me. I literally could not do as much as I do on my day to day if not for the flexibility of Linux and all the associated programs. This is, you know, my very small, minuscule, minor, minor way of being able to contribute back just a little bit to hopefully help other people out. And uh, yeah, so, you know, for you, if if there's something that, you know, you enjoy doing or you can that you can share, I think that it's important that we do share with one another that open source philosophy of how we do things and so forth. You know, especially you, Wendy, with your, your camera thing, because I find that I'm at the point where I'm <laughs> gathering lots of information. So I do appreciate all that you share with the rest of us. Well, thank you very much. And I do love sharing my passion for photography just as much as I love sharing my, my passion for Linux and hardware and all of that fantastic stuff. And it's great to see that you you sharing just because you may not be a developer doesn't mean that there aren't places for you to help with a different with a project. Speaking of photography, I actually messed with raw therapy a little bit. So my main editing program is Darktable. I absolutely love it. I've got a, a pretty solid workflow down. But one of the new things in the latest release, version 5.8 of raw therapy, is that you can take an image that's a little bit soft. It's a little 
little bit out of focus. And this is what I learned when playing with it and sharpen it up a bit. So I shared with, a, in a private group, a picture that I took this week. And then I shared it on the discourse. If you go to the fun with dark table thread, I shared a picture in there of a creek. I did a long exposure of a creek and there is a piece of wood in front and a rock in front that's not a little out of focus. It's pretty out of focus, especially if you have the image blown up all the way. And I find that really distracting. So I said I was disappointed in the picture and Nate and Michael told me that I was being a perfectionist. <laughs> but because you were. I thought it was a great photo. But I was Wendy, curious. You're, to Wendy, this. You're, you're always a perfectionist when it comes to photos. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I know. So that makes it easier to be a perfectionist, right? Because I know what I want it be or quote unquote what it should be. So I, I was disappointed in, in this destruction. So I threw it into Roth therapy because they have this lens blur recovery. And on that rock and that log, it didn't work really well just because it was too far out of focus. It was too far out of what we call depth of field of what area of the picture is in focus and then what's out of focus behind it or what's out of focus in front. And it was just too far out of the front focus part. But I was able to take some pictures of deer that I took where we go, we usually have a salt block set up so the deer can come get some salt. And this doe was up there and some of the pictures were just a little bit soft because I was sneaking at the same time as trying to take the pictures and all excited. So my focus button was a little off. And and I was really surprised at how it takes this image of her that was just a little bit soft and cleans it up just enough that you can see the detail of fur and the light in her eye. It was super cool. So there will be a link in the description for the latest version of Raw Therapy so you can play with that too. And Wendy, you can blame me for the next game recommendation. You're welcome. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What do we got coming now? What what game <laughs> have you found been playing with? Uh, it's one called Con- Conglomerate 451. Okay, so what is it about? It's a dungeon crawling uh, cyberpunk game. So first person. So <laughs> you you can yell at me about that when you go and buy it. Uh, it's only ten dollars. Right. Yeah, normally it's like twenty bucks. Think about this one. It's just unique. Um, there's not a lot of cyberpunk like dungeon crawlers. There's just the battle. That it, it gets a bit repetitive. I mean, but most dungeon when what, what, let's be honest, what dungeon crawling type games don't like the combat's very to the point. <laughs> Okay, but, so you need to dumb it down for some of us non-gamers. What do you mean by a dungeon crawler? Think miss first-person view, grid-based, roguelike games. That's kind of where that sits. It, it's one of those games where that it has enough RPG elements that make it more interesting. So uh, it's got a bit of XCOM vibe to it as far as like you can customize the, the party a lot and that kind of stuff. So uh, there's a lot of customization that makes me really, really, really like this game. But I'm also not oblivious to the fact that it's not going to be for everyone. Linux native. So awesome. for, for those that are complaining that we only talk about Proton games and all the other stuff, this is a Linux native game. That is super awesome. I'll have to take a look at it. I don't I don't know if I'll buy it yet. I'm horrible when it comes to first person shooter games. And well, I know it's turn based combat. Okay. So, so it'll it's, be a little easier for th- uh, think Final Fantasy, like seven. So very menu driven and that kind of stuff. It's not active what they would call active battles. So, so you I have- might actually survive because I know I have the twenty sixteen version of Doom. My husband's pretty good at it and I can't get past like the first or it's just not just just not your thing <laughs> i'm slow i don't move enough and even my daughter my oldest daughter is standing behind me mom you gotta move and i'm like but <laughs> but i'm also trying to aim yeah definitely not the games that i you, you don't have to worry about any of that <laughs> okay i'll check it out it might be for me this this is legit <laughs> point it's a static image you point the mouse over it you click it you tell it one two three or four for ability and you just tell it to do turn basically so that's where the crawler comes from yeah right? and, and, and then as gotcha. after you hit that particular piece of combat you go you arrow key you know or wasd to the next grid next grid until you run into combat again to advance the the story and the that's really all it is so uh 
to go with the context of moving targets and you know we we were talking about ux and U, ui design and nate talks about being a very big plasma fan i use plasma um wendy i'm not sure Plasma's what you're awesome. on I'm not sure what you're on right now. Plasma. I've used Plasma now for a couple years. What's on all of the systems, even so, the computer that the kids use is Plasma. Nice. So can safely assume that we're mostly, uh, you know, KDE Plasma fans around here. Sorry. Sorry, GTK people. <laughs> Just it's what it is. So I've been messing around with a distro that looks to bring that elementary OS experience with UX to Plasma. And that's called Nitrix. Now they've changed a lot of things that some people used to complain about. And it's, but I'm not going to get into what they used to complain about. I only look at the here and now. They have restructured the menu system for Plasma, such a customized version of Plasma that I can't really almost call it Plasma. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the fantastic things about Plasma is that a distribution can take it and really make it their own. As an example, so like if you hover over, I'm going to call them applets, and I know technically that's not the right, the widget <laughs> in the for the panel. If you actually hover over it and you click on the down arrow, you know how in normal Plasma, you just get the, the little notification box for whatever it is. So if you yeah. like, these are more reminiscent of like Ubuntu Touch as far as they're okay. like their applets so like it, it it's down the whole side of their drop downs for the entire side of the screen so it's almost like that uh that slide out menu that deepen had at one point but it's per applet oh, so wow. So it's small stuff like that. That's really, really cool. Um, the menu's very reminiscent of the elementary OS uh, menu. So that's kind of going to be a love it or hate it kind of thing. There's a lot of attention to detail that you normally don't get in a lot of the Plasma-based distros. And personally, I, my only gripe with it is the the base. And that it, it's in this weird transition that there's still some bionic repos that it uses because it's based, uh, they're, they're pulling from... I believe neon on certain things, but there's a bunch of 2004 stuff as well. So it's an Ubuntu base. So it, that's a little weird. <laughs> but, Seems like they're for the most part, but they're making that work though. Yeah, for the, for the most part, it works really well. Just being a guy who's been using Arch and Arch based distros and flat packs and all the, you know all the other stuff for so long now, I I do have a hard time sometimes going back to static releases of of things. The nice thing is these guys have snaps enabled. These guys have flat packs enabled. These guys they don't care. So you can get whatever program you want in whatever version that you need and make it work. The snaps are enabled by default I'm, i don't remember if i had an enable flat flat packs or not the nice thing is in in discover there's a little drop down that says snaps or debs basically <laughs> so you can get whatever one you want when you go into the application so if you'd like to continue discussions about ux ui or a variety of other linux topics you can continue these discussions with us on telegram and discourse our mobile or Discord servers. You can visit DLN website for more information on how to connect to these social channels and also all the shows and creators by going to destinationanalytics.net. So y you can follow my ramblings on Twitter at Matt DLN. And all of my contact info is at dlnextend.com slash Wendy. As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another episode of DLN Extend. Until then, have a great week, everybody.